Hello, good morning and welcome to Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily, the podcast that gives you everything you need to know for the day ahead in British politics in under 20 minutes. Hello, it is Thursday, December the 12th. My name is Jack Blanchard of Politico. With me for the very last time this week is Sam Coates of Sky News. And with dread in my heart, I must report to listeners that there is a beige hotel room behind Sam's Zoom image as I log in to see him this morning. Sam, you've been dispatched by Sky News around the country again. Where are you? I am in the Ibis in Cambridge, next to Cambridge Station. It's actually rather nice. Uh, No complaints uh, from here. Uh, Look, it might be mid-December. Some people... Some people, Jack, might be winding down for Christmas, but not us, not our political system. Everywhere you look this morning, people are promising a revolution. Tony Blair in the Daily Mail promising a digital revolution. Rachel Reeves and Pat McFadden are promising a civil service revolution, uh, axing 10,000 civil service posts. Happy Christmas, everyone in Whitehall. Keir Starmer is out and about promising a housing revolution. And that's why I've been overnighting in Cambridge, because he is uh, a few miles away. And we're going to go and uh, talk to him for a quick pool interview this morning. Uh, And... Actually, biggest revolution of all, potentially, Kemi Badenoch in The Spectator promising a revolution of her own to the Conservative Party. It's all go, you and I, Jack, absolutely not slowing down. Never slow down, never slow down. Let's just talk about Kemi Bain, not for a minute before we get into the main news of the day, which is definitely Keir Starman's big planning announcement uh, up in Cambridge. Kemi Bainock is interviewed in The Spectator this week uh, by her old friend and now the editor, Michael Gove, and by the political editor, Katie Pauls. And it is such a fun interview. Um, I was reading it last night. Uh, they, they very generously email out some of the, the words in advance for journalists to read. Um, I was so taken by Kemi Bainock's attitude to lunch this is the kind of answer, right, why all the political journalists in the world were delighted when Kemi Badenoch won the Tory leadership contest. There is nobody else who's leading a major party who would give an answer like this. What do you think of lunch, Kemi Badenoch? Here's the answer. Lunch is for wimps. I have food brought in and I work and eat at the same time. There's no times. Sometimes I will get a steak. I'm not a sandwich person. I don't think sandwiches are real food. It's what you have for breakfast. And she says that soggy bread is definitely out. I will not touch bread, says Kemi Badenoch, if it is moist. Now, I just think like the idea that like Keir Starmer or Rachel Reeves or Ed Davey, people like that are not going to give answers like that, saying lunch is for wimps. I very much enjoyed that. Do you, I think we should just pause to ask Sam Coates if he thinks lunch is for wimps. Uh, uh, absolutely not. Um, I'm very proud to be the weight that I am because of lunch. But hang on, just just go back on that answer. So she has lunch at her desk, but sometimes it's a steak. So where where does the steak come from? Like who? I mean, which poor poor person comes in? Is it steak day, Kemi? And sort of in in they walk, only to be sort of uh, sent sent on their sent on their way. Um, uh, she wants to come across as utterly no nonsense. There's another bit where she's asked. This is a very very Michael Gove question. Uh, if her leadership were a restaurant, what type of food would it serve? There'll be lots of red meat, she says. That one's a bit more of a cliche, I have to say. Um, she also hates on Love Actually, which is definitely not the thing you're supposed to do at this time of year. Keir Starmer say Love Actually was his favourite film. Is that why she's decided to pick on it? In a, in a, re- in a reference to himself, you know, I think. <laughs> I mean, you know, again, you know, Keir Starmer, the Love Actually prime minister uh, versus there's actually quite a lot of dark undertones to Love Actually, says Kerry Badenock. There's a British prime minister who's messing around, not doing foreign po- po- policy properly. People are cheating and there's lots going on there if you move away from the smiley, happy, cheesy stuff. And of course... <laughs> have, of course, Sam, her favourite carol is in the bleak midwinter. I mean, it's just it's just belting, it's belting stuff. It's uh, it's mind blowing. There is um, serious substance in there, um, and I think politically, uh, the bit that caught my eye is her sort of diagnosis of what's wrong, uh, of what, basically what's wrong with Britain, and and her answer seems to be everything. So she says. My diagnosis of what is wrong with our country is that we have stopped being entrepreneurial and we've become bureaucratic. The middle classes have changed from people who grow things like farmers or people who build and make things. Now it's skewed towards people who live off the law in one form or another, whether that's regulation, compliance in banking, HR or government uh, contracts. Right. So what she's basically saying, it's sort of everything is wrong with Britain. Uh, and the middle, <laughs> and she's putting the middle classes on notice that she sort of doesn't like their jobs. Uh, 
Now, that's quite an interesting answer for somebody who wants government to be less in their lives. And 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 whilst I do understand what she's getting at uh, by saying that that's the problem uh, with the UK, uh, it's, it's quite a sort of scarily big thing uh, to take aim at. And one wonders whether she will ever actually be able to do so effectively, given the some of her ambitions seem to be to change the industries that everybody in Britain works in. Quite how you're going to do that, I don't know. It's interesting, you know, in the abstract, I think a lot of people do agree with the sort of sentiment there, right? Lots of people feel like, oh, we, we don't make things in this country anymore. That sort of, and, and, and a sort of harking back to a time when, when Britain made, lots of stuff and now everyone has these weird sort of non-jobs that take about 10 minutes to explain over dinner what it is you actually do but as you say it's one thing saying oh I wish it was more like that and another thing how on earth a prime minister I mean prime ministers find it hard enough just to pull the basic levers of government these days let alone to get their tentacles into society and change it but it's still an interesting thing for her to be talking about um, the other thing that she says that's interesting is is, is um, basically an appeal for patience with her approach she says Kemi Bainock says People keep saying, where are your policies? I feel like I'm going to be opening a restaurant in four years' time and people are demanding to see the menu right now. Trying to get people to be patient, I think, is one of the big challenges. People want instant gratification. Um, and by people, she probably means people like us, Sam, who like endlessly ask uh, political leaders, you know, well, what's your position on this? What's your position on this? What's your position on this? And her basic approach is, well, I don't need one yet. Um, and 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 is is that is that a reasonable approach? Well, I, I think if you were to ask somebody opening a restaurant, they wouldn't say. I'm opening a restaurant. They might say I'm opening an Italian restaurant or I'm opening an Indian restaurant or I'm opening a kind of modern brasserie. It's not that the person opening the restaurant would wait in, until day one of the restaurant actually opening and go, oh gosh, this has to be a Chinese. I think they know roughly where they're going. And I think that's I think that's kind of what people are getting at when they're trying to sort of shake down and work out what the direction of her Tory party is going to look like. So I think it's a fair question. I think Kemi Baynott would argue that she has given a pretty clear indications of what her principles are, and her principles might be Chinese food or whatever, uh, if we're going to keep the tortuous metaphor going even longer, but that, that the exact menu of dishes you're going to be served up she has plenty of time to figure that out and i do think and i think i've said this before in this podcast the, the history of opposition party or opposition leaders coming in years before an election and coming up with loads of big early policies history suggests they often have to end up dropping those policies by the time they get to the election because you know things have just moved on we saw it happening to labor repeatedly i remember red Miliband having to do it we saw keir starmer doing it as well this, the world moves on in the few years since you announced your big shiny policy years before the election and it never actually makes it into the manifesto anyway. Um, well, I just wonder whether her sort of hating of the middle class jobs is something that she's still talking about in the run up uh, to, an, to an election. Anyway, what we do know is that Kemi Badenoch hates instant gratification, which is, to be honest, Jack, exactly what we try and provide with this podcast. Uh, so let's get on and do that. Um, and, you know, what we're dealing with today is priorities. And while Kemi has given, given us a sense of priorities without too much detail, uh, the Prime Minister is sort of doubling down on his. Um, we're going to talk about planning, which was one of the six milestones that the Prime Minister outlined last week in his speech, where he said that he wanted to build, by the end of the Parliament, 1.5 million new homes. Um, and here we are kind of in the second phase of his premiership after a big reset, uh, concentrating on those six milestones as things that he wants to deliver um, as we head into a spending review. Just before we get into the planning bit of the discussion, um, I was in contact with somebody in Whitehall uh, in the last 24 hours um, who have just received from Darren Jones, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, their letter outlining kind of the savings that the department's got to to, to find and the budgets that they that, that, that they're going to negotiate over the next six months um and and they were quite struck by it they got their their spending review letter and they said the word manifesto never appears in the letter once the phrase plan for change which is the new thing that Keir Starmer came up with just last week appears um sort of seven eight nine times in the letter um, and this is not one of the departments that has a big milestone attached to it. And frankly, they are nervous because they are charged with delivering a whole series of manifesto promises. Um, but suddenly it looks as if the government has moved on from its own manifesto and just focusing on the uh, six milestones um, as part of the missions. 
Uh, and they basically said, look, um, you've got a chancellor uh, who doesn't want to renege on her mad manifesto commitments. Uh, so as a consequence, you guys have to give up on yours. That gives you a, that tells you quite a lot about the sentiment in parts of parts of Whitehall towards towards the top at the moment. Um, uh, I think there are tensions in government over uh, the fact that the prime minister has just come up with a new set of priorities, and those priorities sort of leave some people feeling quite high and dry. And if there are tensions in government over that, Sam, can I suggest there are going to be even bigger tensions within the Labour Party over what is coming down the track now on this planning reform that we're going to hear announced today. We're going to see Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner donning their high-vis vests and probably hard hats and whatever else you wear to, to look right on the Sky News when you're being interviewed by Sam Coates about planning. Um, and they will be setting out an overhaul of the planning rules now. You and I have been around long enough, Sam, to see multiple prime ministers try this. David Cameron certainly had a good go at it. And uh, I remember interviewing his former planning minister, Nick Bowles, some years later saying that they'd failed to achieve what it was they wanted to achieve, which was to really make make Britain somewhere where it's much easier to build things quickly. But that clearly needs to happen if Keir Starmer is going to hit that target that you mentioned. And so what we're going to see today is a new publication of or a new version of the National Planning Policy Framework. And if you manage not to switch off the podcast in disgust, as I said that, I'll try not to say it ever again, but it's an important planning document that basically guides how things are built. We've known this moment was coming really long before the even the election uh, was called. Labour has been clear that it was going to do something big on planning and we've been saying all along that it's going to be very controversial when they do it because even though everyone really in the Labour Party um, is is very signed up to the concept of a big building programme, build, 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 yes, millions of homes, lots of infrastructure projects, all those pylons that we need to get the, the green energy grid up to speed and all that stuff, everyone in Labour is signed up to that. When they start telling us where those things are going to be built, it comes into the collision with the reality that Labour now has of having lots and lots of MPs and lots and, and some of those MPs in areas where you wouldn't normally find MPs like home county seats and lovely rural areas. And that's before you get into all onto all the metro mayors who are large, largely now all not quite all, but nearly all Labour metro mayors as well, who are also going to be getting involved in this debate once we start hearing where these houses are going to be built. And of course, it's very easy to be signed up to the idea of lots of house building. But once you're told that it's going to be an 8,000 home development in that beautiful patch of land in your constituency and the entire constituency is up in arms, let's just see, Sam, how many Labour MPs are willing to go along with that sort of thing happening, uh, to use the phrase, in their own backyard. Um, why don't you just talk us through some, the, the, the detail of what we're expecting to get today and what you'll expect to hear from Keir Starmer when you interview him in the next couple of hours? Just before I do, you talk about the scale of Labour opposition. There were there are now over 100 Labour MPs in the growth group WhatsApp group uh, that, they, that, 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 that Labour MPs have set up. So at least 100 of them uh, have uh, signed up in principle to this in a big way. Let's see, as you say, whether or not uh, they continue to do that uh, as we approach local council elections where, where this is all brought into sh sharp relief. Right. Today does three things um, as part of the uh, overhaul of the National planning, planning Policy Framework. It's only a bit of the overall planning jigsaw. There's a planning and infrastructure uh, bit of legislation coming next year, which may actually be even trickier. Uh, but the stuff today is, 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 is there's no doubting it's pretty ambitious. The first, is to restore that mandatory housing target and put it at 1.5 million uh, new homes. Um, uh, that is also the government's milestone and they want to do it before the end of the parliament. Uh, that's 370,000 homes a year, Jack. That is way more that we have had uh, and has been built uh, in recent years. Matthew Pennycook, who is the planning minister in Angela Rayner's department, uh, admitted that it is going to be very difficult to hit that target. Keir Starmer says that kind of almost proudly, uh, that it's going to be very difficult to hit this target. Uh, but uh, that is what they say they're going to do. Um, we were given some indication of where the houses are going to fall, which councils they were going to fall in before the summer. Um, there have been tweaks, I am told, uh, to where they fall. Not an over, not, not a wholesale change, uh, but there will be uh, a little bit of movement. 
Look out for what happens in London. Uh, they are aware of the row because they cut the number of houses needed to needed to be built in London, uh, arguably where housing is needed the most uh, at the expense of some other uh, semi uh, rural areas. Uh, so that's one big thing. The second big thing uh, is that they are going to force councils to have up to date local plans. So councils can decide where they put these new homes, providing they get on and, and, and create a plan. Now, the bit that Labour MPs are interested in is what happens when councils try and dodge this or um, uh, kind of just don't do it because they think it'll cause a row with their councillors, with their voters, uh, or the council simply cannot agree what the local plan uh, should be uh, because it's split. Now, a Labour MP I was talking to is on that growth uh, WhatsApp group yesterday, uh, was saying they are very, very interested in what the powers are for uh, for government to intervene if councils don't coming up come up with a uh, uh, with a plan. Now I asked uh, Angela Rayner's team that, and they said, well, they want to focus on the carrot, um, but there are powers that they can use. But they say they aren't new powers; they're the things that that, that central government already has, uh, which ultimately kind of goes up, I believe, to sort of intervention in the council and uh, and sending people in. But whether or not. Uh, that'll that'll end up being done in order to to hurry through local plans. I, it, it's hard to see, but there are no specific new powers to force councils to do things. And then thirdly, and also very consequentially, um, they are basically going to be pushing for some building on the green belt. Now they're going to say they want to build on brownfield land first. Uh, and they want to make it easier with their Branfield passports to fast track Branfield planning developments. Uh, but they are absolutely upfront. You cannot meet these housing targets on Branfield land uh, alone. So they're pushing at the edges of the green belt. Um, they are going to create a new concept, which is the grey belt, uh, which is uh, they will spell out. They say we haven't seen it before. None of the previews got the de got the definition right. We will find out today what the grey belt actually is. Um, but I think if there are two towns, uh, it makes it easier for there to be more building between those two towns uh, to extend the kind of urban areas that we already have. So th those are the main things that are coming today. In the planning and infrastructure bill next year, you'll also get an overhaul of planning committees. Uh, modernization of that a bit more compulsory purchase orders um, and that's also where you get to the really tricky stuff uh, which is whether or not the environmental regulations and the nature regulations are all fit for purpose uh, which could be a big row coming down the track because uh, if they don't do anything about that things won't get built but if they do there'll be a massive row uh, and questions over whether or not they're going to break their manifesto commitments uh, but that is uh, a controversy for another day uh, simply the targets and how to reach them today uh, is the big priority. Uh, and this is just hugely important politically for Labour that this works for a number of reasons. One is that, as we know, they are promising growth, growth, growth is their priority. Um, and building lots and lots of houses is certainly one way of trying to stimulate economic growth. Uh, as a government. The big question is, how quickly will this feed through? There is some reporting uh, in the FT today from sort of house building expert type people saying that it will take years for this to actually filter through into terms of the in terms of like large numbers of homes being built and therefore economic consequences from that. And the fear for Labour will be that can this can all this be done, not the legislation, but the actual end point be reached in time for the next election for there to be lots of lots of voters in new houses going, oh, thank you very much, Labour, for finally fixing this housing crisis uh, that, that might help them get re-elected. Uh, the other reason is that um, housing is one of the issues that uh, that Nigel Farage and his Reform UK party are keen to push very hard on. Nigel Farage's analysis, you will be unsurprised to hear, is that uh, the main problem in terms of housing in the country is related to immigration. And you might or might not agree with that, but regardless of your own analysis, that is certainly a punchy message that he is going to be pushing very hard because he knows lots and lots and lots of people feel very angry in this country about the cost of um, housing, the fact they can't afford their own houses. Uh, and Labour need to try and deal with that threat. Uh, and this is their solution to doing it. So the, the short uh, version of all of that is this needs to work for Keir Starmer and as I said at the start the political jeopardy is high because multiple prime ministers over the past 10-15 uh, years have recognised this problem have claimed they were going to do anything about it have announced flagship planning reforms I've lost count of how many times I've written about flagship planning reforms and overhauls and modernisations in this country and yet here we are at the end of 2024 with another new prime minister saying he has to do the same thing as well. Essentially 
at the end of the day, in order to get things going, the message from Keir Starmer is the opposite of what he said in opposition. It's Whitehall knows best. So long as, you know, people don't play ball, it will come back to central government pulling the levers to make things happen. That's quite a different approach from the rhetoric that we have been used to. Anyway, that's the buzzer, which means that's it from us uh, for today and for this week. We will find out how it all went down uh, when we're back with you on Monday. All right. Have a good time with Keir, Sam, and then have a great weekend. Cheers. Cheers.